What's up, guys? I'm the Faithless Father, and today we are talking about why the New Testament, the second part of the Bible, is a fraud. We will be getting to that. I'm going to do a precursor, just talk about a couple really short um, things here, and then we'll get into the main topic of today's video. First, I want to talk about why people believe in Christianity today. Why is it that people believe Jesus is a God? And there's really four main reasons. They grew up that way, number one. Two, smart people tell them that. Three, personal experiences. And four, the Bible. Now, these really aren't that good of reasons to believe that Jesus is a God. Um, but these are kind of what we find. We should note that if you're taught something since you were born, and even perhaps since you were in the womb, it is very difficult to, to break out of those uh, thoughts, to break out of what you've been taught since you were a fetus, even, both times. W many people have find themselves in the womb in church listening to hymns about Jesus even before they were born. Uh, and so to break out of those concepts, to break out of those thought processes, to break out of that lens through which their parents and themselves look through, look at the world is more difficult for them than say the person who's born without a god in their life or in other words without someone teaching them that a god exists smart people can still be wrong there are people that are very intelligent that have been wrong about a number of different things personal experiences from the most part when you talk to these christians um, that say they have a lot of these personal experiences that testify of the godhood of Jesus. Most of them don't have an identifying stamp that says, this is, this is the work of Jesus. Uh, you'll hear, at least in my experience with the thousands of people that I've spoken with about this, uh, both in Argentina for two years straight and then throughout my life, as I've been fascinated with religion for my entire life because I was born into one. Um, a Christian sect, Mormonism, uh, is that these personal experiences are often like the universe is working in my favor, or things are coming together, um, things are working together for my good, things like this, um, or coincidental things like I met this person and I'm teaching him about Jesus, so this is ordained of Jesus, or ordained of God, because this is what I'm um, all about, I'm teaching people and spreading the good word, the good news. And so it seems to me that this is divine intervention that I met this person and I'm sp teaching them about Jesus. Things like this are kind of the rationale that a lot of believers use to say and, and think that this is evidence that Jesus is a God. There are a few instances where someone might say like they had a vision in their dream uh, or, or a vision in real life sometimes on substances, who knows, but uh, they had a vision and they saw perhaps Jesus with the nails in his hands. Um, sometimes they don't say that though. Sometimes they just say like they saw a guy with a beard that looked like Jesus. And it's like, well, we don't have any images of Jesus. This was 2000 years ago. We don't know what Jesus looked like. We have an idea. Perhaps he looked like a Jew, um, obviously, but, uh, other than that, we have no identifying characteristics. So a lot of these personal experiences are not necessarily identifying that Jesus is a God. So they don't serve as evidence for such. And even if they did, it would simply be anecdotal. So not necessarily strong evidence. I'll add that people of all different religions with all sorts of different gods have told me that they've had personal experiences which um, support the idea that their God does exist and that their God is real. Like I spoke with a Hindu a few months ago. She told me that she was meditating. Um, she had an experience where she levitated off the ground as she was meditating in prayer. And she saw all these amazing lights like around the room. She saw Krishna, which is a God in, in Hinduism. And uh, that was her testimony builder, her evidence that Hinduism was true, that the Vedas are true, that um, the Bhagavad Gita is uh, how we should live. It's a 
manual for life and these things very similar to what christians say what muslims say so these experiences are not unique to christianity they are found in all religions and they have been through time we've always been having these divine like experiences and people attribute those to their belief system any number of things could occur in life and you could just attribute those to any god really um, and that works just as well as a Christian saying like these events occurred coincidentally or they all work that seem in a way where they they fit together um, really nicely, but it's not evidence that Jesus was a God at all. It could be uh, another God, any other God it could be a, a God that we don't even know about that we haven't even heard of yet. So um, and I don't rule that possibility out. I, I It seems to me that it's very likely that Jesus was not a God, but I don't stand firm as many atheists do that there is no God or um, in a sense where they feel very strongly that there isn't a God because there hasn't been sufficient as evidence to believe so. Um, I still hold the idea that perhaps there might be a God. I'm just not convinced of that yet. That God hasn't made himself known clearly to us yet. And so... Perhaps all these things are happening, but it's probably not because of Jesus. There might be some creator, but we we don't know that that is true. Regarding the Bible, the Bible is mostly the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament, which is hardly Christian. The case is very hard to make that the Hebrew Bible stands as a testament of Jesus in any way, whether that be his natural life or his godhood, um, his godlike nature. This case is very hard to make. Christians say that it's clear. Um, and then they, they cite these prophecies in the Old Testament that testify to what, everything Jesus did and and stuff. But it's not clear whatsoever that the Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament testifies of Jesus or his godhood. So, <clears throat> so what that leaves you with in the within the Bible is just the New Testament, which is what we're going to talk about today. The New Testament is a fraud in the simplest terms, and I'll explain why. Here is a portrayal of the New Testament as many Christians see it today. Not all Christians, but many Christians, mostly the fanatic evangelicals that are always trying to convert you. They think that Matthew wrote Matthew, Luke wrote Luke, and forgive me if this is tedious, but I'm going to go through all the 27 books. That Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, John wrote John. That the book of Acts, most people understand that the author of Luke also wrote the book of Acts. So people think that Luke also wrote Acts. People think that Paul wrote Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and that Timothy had a part in the writing of Philemon, that Paul wrote Hebrews, um, that James wrote James, Peter wrote 1 and 2 Peter, that John wrote 1 John, that John even wrote 2 and 3 John, that Jude wrote Jude, and that John also wrote Revelation. This is the view of these types of people. Many Christians today believe this. Now, this is great, okay? Even if there aren't a ton of personal experiences that occur in our lives today where we can identify the hand of Jesus in all of our lives, we might have these texts. And if, if all these texts were written like that outlook claims like that perspective asserts that all these people really wrote these books then sure that's something to at least discuss that matthew john peter james and jude really wrote some of these books like that would be something to talk about because then we have a first hand account of someone that was walking with jesus that was with jesus all the time 
that would be at least something to discuss. Paul never saw Jesus whatsoever in real life. I should say Paul never, excuse me, I don't want to seem derogatory, but Paul never walked with the mortal Jesus. And everyone believes that. Unless you're an uneducated Christian, which there are many that I speak with that didn't know that. But Paul never even claims to have known Jesus while he was still alive. There's very little information that we even read in any of the Pauline or pseudo-Pauline texts that, that tell us about, um, about Jesus. If you look at the seven undisputed letters, specifically, there are very few facts about Jesus uh, in his mortal life. We have, uh, I'll list a couple. He, he tells us he was born of a woman, he was a Jew, um, among a couple other basic facts. So all we have are potentially those firsthand eyewitnesses and their texts, uh, which ostensibly we have in the New Testament. And that's understandable. I can understand why people would believe in something like that in spite of the fact that there's like no other evidence for that. In spite of the fact that perhaps we don't have any identifying personal experiences, anecdotes going on anywhere. Um, in spite of the fact that like you may have grown up with this idea and so you're more prone to believing these things. Um, taking into account all these things. If we just had these texts, then that would be something. But now let's contrast that perspective that view or that lens with what I believe is true, what I believe is accurate, along with many of the critical scholars of the New Testament and Christian origins, and actually many educated Christians as well um, have this viewpoint that I'm about to express. And that is that Matthew did not write Matthew, in fact, that Matthew was anonymously written the same is the case with Mark, Luke, John, that Acts was written anonymously, except for the portions uh, in the book where we read the we verses, where it says we did this and we did that, which is a case of non-pseudepigraphic forgery, which it, meaning that the author doesn't say that I am this person specifically, but writes in a way in which we would assume that this author was really here, that this author was really involved in these events which are being described. Uh, that's a case of non-pseudepigraphic forgery. The seven books that are undisputed at large are Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. These are the only books in the New Testament that people agree that Paul wrote. And, and I do believe that Paul wrote these books. And we see from this perspective, from the more critical perspective, that Ephesians was not written by Paul, but someone pretending to be Paul. That Colossians follows in that same way was written by someone who was claiming to be Paul, but was not actually Paul. Second Thessalonians, pseudepigraphic, written by someone pretending to be Paul. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus, the pastoral epistles, all written by either one or multiple authors pretending to be Paul. Hebrews is actually anonymous. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. It was likely not Paul. James was not written by the brother of Jesus, but someone pretending to be him. First Peter, Second Peter were written by someone claiming to be Peter, but who was not actually Peter. First, Second, and Third John, um, written by someone who was not John the Beloved. First John being a case of non-pseudepigraphic forgery, written in a way that would imply that he is John, but where he doesn't explicitly say that I am John. Second and third John are anonymous, but likely not John, as a lot of people think. Jude was not written by the brother of Jesus. And finally, the 
unique case of revelation in which the author was someone named John, but was not John the Beloved, known as a homonymous text. When this analysis is done of the texts in the New Testament, we see that 25, roughly 25% of the books are anonymous. Almost half of the books, 44.4%, were forged, or in other words, are pseudepigraphic, um, to put it kindly, if you are willing to take that stance. 25%, roughly, are authentically Pauline, and 3.7% of the books are homonymous, meaning just Revelation was written by a dude named John, which equates to 50% of the words in the King James Version of the Bible are anonymous, 24.8% of the words in the King James Version of the Bible are forged, and these numbers are going to be different depending on whichever Bible you got laying around. All the words of God are different, so these numbers are going to vary slightly depending, and perhaps even significantly, depending on which Bible you have. 18.1% are authentically Pauline. Six point six percent of the words in the King James Bible are homonymous, coming from someone that was named John, but was not John the Beloved. And this is not uncommon. Perhaps you don't know this, but these aren't the only books that Christians wrote in the first and second centuries. There were many books that were written by Christians, and there are these books in the New Testament are outnumbered by books that were written by Christians outside of the New Testament. And many of them are forgeries. They are pseudepigraphic texts that are likely not included in the New Testament because the early church fathers recognized that these uh, non-canonical books are, are not authentic. They're not written by the people that they say they were. Um, and uh, that's likely why they weren't included in the canon of Scripture of the Christians since the early days of Christianity. And so uh, I don't find it odd whatsoever that some of the books we have in our New Testament are not written by the people that the text indicates. So when perhaps you hear that Christianity has a leg to stand on because the New Testament serves as testimony of the life of Jesus and of his works, uh, his miracles, etc., perhaps not. Perhaps these texts are not valid and even as far as fraudulent I would go to say I will be making videos specific to each one of these texts that are questionable regarding authorship and I'll go through why a lot of the scholars dispute the authorship uh, of the texts when they do specify that they were written by a certain individual so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on those videos as well so in summary, the New Testament stands as no evidence, surely, that Jesus was anything special. Surely that he was, uh, surely it doesn't stand as evidence that he was a god in any way. Here we have rumors, likely spoken of by word of mouth for decades until they were written down eventually by anonymous people that never even saw Jesus. And we have texts written by people who are spuriously claiming to be someone else in a deceitful and untruthful way, a dishonest way, that are likely writing to support some doctrine that they believe is true within Christendom. Uh, if, you, if you look at it, we can really say that, uh, so 24% of the words, um, roughly, roughly a quarter, of the words in the King James Bible were written by deceivers, by dishonest people. Um, that's no, in no small measure is that something wrong. That's, that's fraud. Despite some of the sensitivities that people may have toward the culture of the time and their ideas and how they were 
um, th this is fraud. Uh, and so when you see that almost a quarter of the Bible of the of the New Testament was written by liars, it begs some questions here. Um, it doesn't necessarily make you confident in what you're reading. And then also that half of the New Testament was written by people that we don't even know, who perhaps, uh, who likely never even met Jesus, but only heard stories about him. It doesn't amount to much. All we have is Paul. All we have is someone who said they had a vision of Jesus and that went around preaching his ideas about Christianity. Many of the ideas that we hold today about Christianity um, are directly from Paul. We don't have any writings from any of the other 12. What people read in the New Testament is mostly Paul. We have uh, uh, most of the New Testament, probably more than three quarters of the books in the New Testament, um, Most of these books were either written by Paul or written by people pretending to be Paul. And so a lot of these ideas perfuse throughout Christianity today, and people listen to what Paul had to say. He was a very powerful force in the establishment of Christianity, um, especially the sect that eventually became more popular and the sect that we view today, that many of us are a part of today. But not, it was not the only sect of Christianity in the first century or the second century. There were many different sects that had different ideas about who Jesus was and what he was doing, uh, his nature, his relationship to God, and uh, things like that. And from Paul, we have the idea that it is nothing but your belief that Jesus rose from the dead that allows you to be saved. And that idea mostly comes from his experience that he thought he saw Jesus and uh, that he lives today. That was what Paul said. And from that experience comes most of our doctrine of um, Protestant Christianity today. If you like what you heard today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any other videos. And uh, if, you, if you are interested in sharing the video, make sure to do that as well. We will be covering topics regarding philosophy and religion. Um, I'm mostly interested in early Christianity and uh, the doctrines therein, and also Mormonism. I know a lot about those two topics, so Christianity at large and the sect of Mormonism, because I grew up as a member of the LDS Church. Um, but we will be covering a vast array of different topics within religion and philosophy as well. So subscribe if you're into that stuff. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next time.